on the secondary screen. Раз, едно, раз, два. Tady máš tohle, musíš to... A to by mělo už fungovat. Já myslím, že jo, tam to, jenom, tohle je mute nebo unmute. Tak pokud tam to posuneš, tak to by mělo fungovat. Jo. Super. Okay. Tak já jenom řeknu, jak se jmenuješ za minutu, můžeš začít. Jo. Dej si vodu zatím. No, určitě. <laughs> So hello everyone, uh, please welcome our next speaker, uh, Tomasz Tomeczek, some applause please. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Tomasz, I'm working for Red Hat and for past year I was working on building Docker images. So uh, let's start with a question, so who has already of you built, let's say, hundreds of Docker images today. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, okay, let's start with the talk. Uh, so, the theme uh, or the name of the talk is, is it hard to build a Docker image? So, I think that it's not pretty hard, right? It's just writing a Docker file, which is pretty much not very hard. Uh, then you just run Docker build, it's done, and w what can possibly be hard about this, right? Uh, so, yeah, that was the talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone got any questions? Okay, so I... <laughs> yeah, I'll get to it. Okay, so let's, let's make the question a little bit harder. Okay, so this was pretty short. Let's go with this question. So, is it hard to build an image with constant in an environment which constantly changes and you can't control it 
and every release of Docker may break something and you need to adapt your code and that kind of stuff. Uh, well, my, my answer for this question is, what? I mean, <laughs> uh, and that's the theme of this talk. So uh, here's the agenda. So what I would like to talk about is that I would like to show some problems with Docker images then show you what's the problem, why is it a problem, and how to solve it. Uh, we'll cover squashing layers. Uh, if you don't know what layers are, we'll get to it. Uh, we'll also talk about invalidating build cache, which can be a real pain sometimes. Uh, we'll also cover the uh, secrets, which you would like to use during build, but you don't want to them be exposed in final image. Uh, we also, uh, but the first thing I will talk about will, that I will explain how Builder works. Uh, then we'll talk about images metadata. Uh, and finally, some controversial topic will be the changes in Docker ecosystem. Okay, so as I said, uh, okay, so if you are interested, I would be really glad if you stay and listen to this. But if you are not, I mean, it's fine for you to stand up and leave. I, I won't mind especially when I made the description of the talk like really mysterious and didn't tell you anything about what this is about. Okay, so thanks. Uh, okay, let's start. <laughs> uh, okay, so how Builder works. Uh, let's start with some simple introduction to the Docker ecosystem. So in past, when someone said Docker, it usually means the container engine, the stuff which manages your containers and you can run your application inside. But right now, Docker is a huge ecosystem. It's multiple projects, they interact together and they're starting to be pretty complicated. And right now, if someone says Docker, it, for me, it just means the company behind it. So, uh, but the container engine itself, the thing which is running on your laptops, on your servers, uh, it's actually a single binary. So Docker is a single binary. It, ha it has tens of megabytes. Megabytes is really big. And part, and part of this binary, there are two components, actually. First component is the engine, the container engine, the daemon, which is running forever and takes care of all the containers. And then there is Docker client, which is also in the same binary. And it talks to the engine via the a API, which is the HTTP API, actually. Uh, so the builder, uh, that's the part which uh, takes care of build. It has its own API endpoint. It's actually slash build, if you are interested in that one. And what Docker client passes to the build is not the Docker file, which someone might expect, but actually the tar stream, which means, so when you run Docker build locally, you won't point it to Docker file, you will point it to directory. And what client does that it will create an archive of it and it streams it into the uh, engine via the uh, endpoint. That's kind of like, okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Docker build. Okay, that's, that's the introduction. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so we know how we can build the image, but we still don't have the Docker file. So Docker file is it's a file. Uh, and it, it has a set of instructions, and these instructions have arguments. Some of the instructions are like run, command, from, maintainer, port, volume, that kind of stuff. Uh, so you will feed it to the client, client will send it to the server, server will process it, uh, and that's it. And it will uh, actually execute all the commands. Uh, if you are interested about writing Docker files, I actually wanted to mention some tips, but when I saw Honza Horak's talk, which will, be, which will happen tomorrow, it names developing containers in enterprise world. It's really great. I really recommend going there. So we know how to write Docker files. That was quick. Uh, let's move on. So here's some simple Docker file. It's on the right, so it's like from Fedora 23 uh, and that kind of stuff. And on the left side, you can see the actual output I'm, I think that you've already seen this. So let's go over what's really happening in the, in the back end. So here are all the steps. So just go over it and I will jump to the back slide, to the slide, to the previous slide and I will explain you. Is this flash thing working? Nice. Uh, okay, so let's go over. Uh, we'll go with a step number one. The step number zero is kind of complicated, step number one is better. So the first thing Docker does when it 
uh, starts processing the instruction copy is that the first thing is that it will look into the cache. If, if it's already in cache, it will take the image from cache and goes to the next, so it's super, super quick. Uh, the lookup means that uh, it will see if the parent image is the same as in the previous run, and if the comment is the, exactly the same. If they are all the same, just goes to another one. In, in this case, it also checks uh, modified time of the file, so if it won't change, uh, it takes from the cache. In my case, as you can see, there is no, no mentioning of taking something from cache. Uh, uh, it's actually processing the instruction. So uh, then you can see that it will take the previous image from a uh, previous step, which is Fedora 23. So it will take that image. It will create container from it. Uh, it will apply the change. The change in this case is that it will copy the file. Oh, oh. Uh, sorry about that. I have two big fingers. Uh, yeah, I'm lost. Okay, so it will copy the file Pomelo uh, to the root folder. Uh, then it will commit the container, which means that it will create an image from container. It will save it to cache, and that's pretty much it. That's how the steps uh, work. So the next step is very similar. Look into the cache, it's not there, create container, apply change, create image, done. And we have our image. You can also see that it, it's removing the uh, containers, so it's this line, so this is the container which was used to process, and it's not needed, so it's removed. Uh, you can, of course, uh, manipulate this, so you can tell, it, tell Docker to leave all the containers and that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's actually pretty simple, and if you look at it, you can do that with, with the client. You don't need uh, the whole build API endpoint. You can run the commands with Docker run, you can copy files with Docker copy, and you can create images from containers with Docker commit and change. Change actually takes an instruction from Docker file and arguments, so you can pretty much do the whole build within client. You don't need server for that. And that's actually what Docker is trying to do right now. They are trying to get builder from daemon and move it onto the client or maybe create a new client. So yeah, that's the current movement. And the another important thing I'd like to mention, which we'll talk more about later, is layering. Okay, so let's get back. Uh, so layers. Docker is using copy and write file system for all the containers. So each instruction creates a new layer. So, yeah, so this is actually, okay, let's pretend this is one layer, this is another layer, and this is another layer. And what it means, that when Docker is creating your containers, it will take all these layers and apply all of them, like pancakes, so you take base image, this one pancake, next uh, layer is copy, so another layer, another pancake, and that's how your container is actually uh, look in the end. So, for example, in this case, this layer will have the whole Fedora 23 image. Uh, this layer will have just the single file, and this layer will be pretty much empty because there is no file system change. There is no metadata, metadata change. Okay, that's it. Uh, okay, so let's start with some problems. And the first problem is that we have we have these layers and. There's a lot of them, and we like to squash them. We don't want like 10 layers, we want just two or three. And that's the issue what's about, like uh, squashing layers to, uh, from multiple layers to create a single one. Okay, why? Why do I want to do that? Uh, there are a couple of points. The first point is performance. Since all of these layers are uh, new copy and write file systems, uh, and if you have them, plenty of them, they will take a lot of space. It, it takes some time to create the final container from all these layers. So if you have containers with, I don't know, like 1,000 layers, it will take like seconds to even start it, and that's not what you want. You want to start your container like as soon as possible, right? So yeah, performance, that's the main point. Uh, another point is also image size. Uh, the way layers work is that if you remove some files uh, in a layer, uh, the files will be still there on your disk, living in there forever, ever, and if you download an image, 
uh, with some files which are removed in one of the steps, they are still in some of the layers. So for example, let's go back. Uh, if I try to do in this uh, layer to remove file pomelo, it, will be, it would be still in the final image, but what Docker does is that it will just tell uh, or write a file within the layer to say that, okay, in the, final, in the final container, remove this file, but it's still in there. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and those, that system, it's called whiteouts. Just for the reference, if you ever see that name, it's about removing files from layers. Okay, so what are the solutions? Uh, there are a couple. So first is to optimize our Docker file to uh, merge all the instructions to be within one. So for example, if you are changing metadata, some like environment variables, do it within line one layer, not within multiple. Same goes for running commands, do it within one huge long, uh, one huge long run, and not in the multiple. Uh, next thing what you can do is that you can do Docker export and Docker uh, import, which means that uh, it will squash your uh, image into a single layer and it will import it into Docker, which is like really neat. You have just one single layer. But the problem with that is that if you want to share this image with the whole world, they will have to download the all content. So you can't, think, you can't take advantage of the caching. So for example, if I squashed my image, which I was already showing to you, it, uh, and some of the user would like to download it, the user would also download the Fedora base image, even though if it would be already on his uh, computer. So this, I think that this is pretty good if you want to download an image, squash it and run it, but to, uh, to share it with other people, that's like not really uh, practical. And the next thing you can do is you can use some custom tooling to squash the layers, excuse me. So right now there are uh, two possible solutions which I was able to find. Uh, so first one is called Docker Script. It's, called, it's created by Mare Goldman from Red Hat and we are actually using it in production. So if you have some uh, layered image from Red Hat, uh, it's, the layers are being squashed by this tool. So yeah, it's working, it's really great. Uh, there's another tool called Docker Squash uh, which is written by community. And the thing is that if you open the GitHub page of the tool and look into issue tracker, there's like multiple issues and so it almost looks like it's not being maintained anymore or the guy doesn't have enough time to work on it. So yeah, I totally recommend Docker scripts. So is anyone interesting to know how these things work? I can talk about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the way this works is that you have two commands within Docker, it's Docker save and Docker load. With Docker save, you can take the image from Docker and save it on your laptop as a one archive. And this archive contains all the layering. So what you can do is that you can Docker save, you have all the layers, you will squ squash them, so you merge the uh, root FS of all the layers, you will merge the metadata, then you will create the exact, uh, like the same structure of the archive and you do Docker load and get it back into the Docker engine. So this way you can actually easily squash the layers. Okay, not easily. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's all to squashing. Uh, if you are interested to, like to mo know more, these issues are all related to squashing. And for example, if you can see, here's issue number 300, which means like two, two years old and it's still not being fixed. So squashing with Docker, it's still not possible. There are also some pull requests which are actually done by a Docker employee and they were not merged, so pity. Uh, okay, let's move to another problem and that is invalidating build cache. Yeah, this is a simple one, so I, I don't want to do all the hard stuff in the beginning. <laughs> okay, invalidating build cache. That's pretty much a simple problem. So you have build cache, it's really great when you want to develop an image or a Docker file, so it saves you a lot of time, so yeah, it's great. But sometimes it takes stuff from cache you don't want it to. For example, these commands. 
I think that usually you want to run these comments all the time or pretty much. Th so the point, my point is that they change over time. So if I right now do DNF install HTTPD, it will install a version of HTTPD. If I do it in a minute later, it's pretty much the same. If I do it in one year later, it will be probably a very different package. And I don't want it to load from cache. I want to actually install the image again. So, and same for, goes for git clone. Uh, okay, so how to solve this? A uh, couple of questions. Uh, I mean, a couple of answers. So what I usually do, I, I prepend a new instruction in front of uh, the instruction I don't want to cache and do some like environment, I know, like build attempt equals one and then I uh, increment it every time I want to invalidate the cache or something like that. Uh, you can also append uh, after a command something like this uh, and do another two, uh, another two pipes and dot every time you want to invalidate the cache. Uh, but I don't recommend because this actually means that uh, if this command fails, the whole build won't fail because this will be the last command, so I don't even know why I put it this here. <laughs> uh, the point uh, of this is that if you are trying to develop an image, I strongly suggest to run it with no cache if you are struggling with cache because the cache is just to improve the build time, nothing else. I guess that you want to de debug your image and not the build cache, so please run it with no cache if there's something odd going on. Uh, possible RFE for this, how to solve this would be if you could in your Docker file said that, okay, so I have this command and I would like to invalidate it after like one hour, 10 minutes, one year. That would be, I guess, pretty good solution. Uh, also, you could set that, okay, never cache this layer or always cache this layer. So you can do that, but for the whole Docker file, not for the each instruction. Uh, if you want to know more why this is still not in Docker, here is an issue, which this, where is the discussion? It's, closed, it's of course closed, so. <laughs> uh, okay, next problem, build secrets. This is a hard one again. Uh, yeah, I need to drink before it. So build secrets, this is a really, I mean, this has been discussed for like two years and it's still not possible to be done. Like, wow. Uh, okay, so what's this about? It's about that during build, you often want to authenticate with something. So when you want to authenticate, you want to authenticate via, I don't know, like a uh, password and public SSH key or something like that. And you don't want those to leak in final image. You don't want your customers to know your private SSH keys, passwords to your whole infrastructure, your bank account, and treasure maps, and something like that. So, and what I'm precisely talking about is that if you do something like this in your images and you share them with the world, uh, I would like to, you, if you could talk to me, I will help you debug it after I hack your computer. Uh, and, <laughs> Because this means, as I already said, that this will stay in the layer forever, ever, and it will never go away. So it might happen that in final image, the file is not there, but it's still in the layer. So if you do Docker safe and look into the layer, the, uh, the private SSH key is still there. Uh, okay, so why? Is here anyone who would like to <laughs> explain why you don't want to share your secrets with the world? Okay, I guess not, that's, that's great. <laughs> uh, okay, so how to solve this? Yeah, as I said, it, it doesn't have like the best solution, so there are just workarounds and kind of stuff. So first solution, which we are actually using, is squashing, because if you squash those layers, the file's never been there, actually. So yeah, that's a really great solution. Uh, another solution I found on the internet is that you can do build in two steps. So if, if during build you want to fetch your uh, application from internet and you need to authenticate, you can do that in one step and in second uh, in one Docker file and you can write another Docker file which will actually install the application. That's pretty okay, but this is definitely not for everyone because you might want to authenticate with some service if you want to install, for example, like packaging, uh, like uh, package manager. Uh, Another solution I thought is a solution was built arguments, which was added to Docker 1.9. But earlier, so, so the thing is that 
uh, you can pass some variables to Docker build, which Docker actually set as environment variables during your build, and uh, they will not leak into the metadata, which is okay, but they will actually leak in history because the uh, layer will have in its command the whole content of the environment variable, so yeah, not a solution, sorry. Uh, okay, so another real solution is that you can fetch the secrets within, the run, uh, within one run instruction. So you can do like curl, give me this SSH key, use it to clone the repo, and then remove it within one layer, so it won't be uh, in the final image. Uh, yeah, for me, the best solution to this problem would be if we could uh, mount some volumes during build, because that way I could put my uh, key in, in the host, then run the build and bind mount the key inside, use it, and the final image would not have the key, but uh, Docker says that they don't want uh, mounting volumes during build because, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Okay, so if you'd like to know more, I strongly suggest to read the first one because uh, it, it explains the issue in great detail, provides more solutions, and it's like a good read. Uh, okay, let's go to the next problem, and then is can only add. What does it mean? So uh, when you are writing your Docker files, you usually try to expose some ports, set some variables, labels, and that kind of stuff. So which means that you do like uh, expose one, two, three, four. Okay, so you have image which has export this port. Then you can write, do another image which uses base image as the first one, but this means that the port will be still exposed. So if in the next image you don't want to expose the port, there is nothing you can do about it. You can only add new metadata to images. You can't remove them in any way. Uh, yeah, and that's what this is about. Uh, why? So yeah, you, uh, your image can contain some metadata you don't want, and there is no way you can like remove them. Or is it? Uh, yeah, so you can export the image as I was showing you in the, ex uh, in the squashing part. You can export it, change the JSON manually, then import it again and uh, it won't be there. Yeah, it's a solution, but it's like a real hack. <laughs> uh, also, uh, you can also rebuild or, or take the Docker file from the base image, rebuild it yourself, remove the instructions you don't want, and you can use this newly built uh, base image. Like, that's a solution, but yeah, okay. Uh, and also, you can uh, blank the metadata. So, for example, if there is some environment variable with some really uh, uh, with some weird value, you can set it to zero or like an empty string, and yeah, that's also a solution. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this is that you might do some base image which has some label set which you don't want or you don't even understand, and you want to remove them, so you can't basically. You can uh, set them as empty, but that's it. Uh, yeah, there are no more information because I couldn't find issue for that, but there, there definitely is one. Uh, if we are still in the metadata space, so yeah, let's talk about having more metadata, metadata about images. Uh, so what's the problem? For me, the problem is that Okay, I find some really nice image on the internet and I want to use it, so I do Docker pull this image. Okay, well, it's really fine. How do I run it? What's inside? Is the content trustable? Is it, there's, are there some CVs? Is there uh, some like that? And for me, that's really an issue. So th the only thing I can do is just go to the internet and look, look for the image, how to use it, what's inside, look at the Docker file and see if it's like, if I can actually use it. Uh, yeah, why? Yeah, because I, I think it's for us, uh, guys who are working in Linux and that kind of stuff, we usually do like, uh, I don't know, uh, system control help, so to see what's, what's, uh, what I can do with system control. Or I, I can look at man page to, look, to check how, the, uh, how to run the command, what it supports and that kind of stuff. And you don't have this with Docker images. Just there are just some blobs sitting on the internet and you can pull them and you have no idea what's inside, how to use it, how to run it, and that kind of stuff. So what we are trying to do within uh, Project Atomic, 
uh, we have a set of labels to which we try to apply to all images uh, we produce. Uh, the spec is in this URL, so you can go and take a look. And this set of labels is trying to like set some standard uh, of, of uh, what's inside the image. So you can see like what's the original registry, where the image comes from, what's inside. There's some simple description. There's also versioning stuff, so you know that yeah, this image is in version one and the release is zero, and there is another image with release ten. So I know that's actually an update. Uh, so yeah, that's one solution. Another solution is is uh, more like runtime solution. Uh, so Pavel Reiskup wrote a very nice uh, image for PostgreSQL, and he's using a framework for like describing the image. So when you run this image uh, in here. It will, like, first it will download from internet, and then it will tell you, like, okay, so this image contains this, and you can configure it like this, and it has these options, and so it actually has the uh, help page. I really like this, and I would, I would be really thrilled to have, like, a standard within Docker ecosystem for, so all the images would have some like this. Okay, let's go to the next problem. And that's evolution, and that's the most, more, most controversial thing. Uh, so as I was working for past year with Docker, with building images and that kind of stuff, the thing we did most, I mean, the most intrusive thing for us was that Docker was changing so rapidly. It was changing with every release. We had to like fix a lot of bugs when the new release came. We had to work around stuff Okay, we need, we are working around this stuff still, uh, and yeah. So the thing is that Docker is still so young; it's just three years old. Uh, they had some bad decisions in the beginning, and then try, they are trying to fix this now, which means that they are breaking compatibility. There's lots of deprecated stuff, and that kind of, uh, and you really need to deal with this. So if you are trying to run Docker in production, you need to be agile. You need to with every release, you need to check what's new, uh, how to fix it, if you can use the new feature, if it's usable, if so, how to use it. And if there is some stuff deprecated, you need, you need to start working on new code to basically remove the feature you were using. Uh, so yeah, this is getting pretty complicated. So uh, if I can talk about it more thoroughly, so what changed? Uh, so for example, specifications changed. Uh, the, there was a change in uh, registry API, there was a V1 API, and now there is V2, which has completely new specs. So if you were using this, the old one are just gone, and the new one uh, is still changing, actually, with 1.10, which was released today. There is a new change in the spec. Uh, okay, networking. So for example, in past, you had just one bridge interface, and right now you can uh, configure the whole networking stack. There's also a DNS server running in your Docker engine uh, right now, or with the 1.10 release, which is like really super controversial. Uh, there was a backend rewrite, so if you were trying to access Varlib Docker in past, and you want to do it today with new release, there was a big change in there, so it will probably break your tools. Uh, okay, so there are also breaks in performance. For example, in 1.9 there was a uh, there was a change with Docker PS. So with 1.9 it was uh, it was slowed down really badly. So they had to fix it in 1.191. Uh, there are also breaks in API, but there are just bugs which are fixed usually. Uh, yeah, about removing, for example, is there anyone who was using Docker Images 3? Uh, 3? I was. Yeah, it was a really great feature, and they just removed it. And there's a huge issue for this, and there are people crying to get it back, and yeah, I guess that Docker will never bring it back. But luckily, there's an external tool with the, exactly the same functionality, so you can still use it. Uh, okay, uh, I was ranting too much, I guess. <laughs> okay, so why? Uh, the slide is blank because I think that the changes are needed. I mean, yeah, the ecosystem is still young and needs to change, needs to improve. Some of the changes are good, some of them are bad, but 
there is like nothing we can do about it. Or well, actually we can. We can send patches and stuff like that, but they usually don't get accepted. Okay, uh, what can you do about it? So you can use as few features as you possibly can, but I don't know if that's a good solution. You can also, uh, I strongly suggest to follow upstream, check their mailing lists, uh, what they are up to, what they are working on, and start preparing like your infrastructure for a next new Docker release. Or you can fork Docker actually. Uh, that is what somewhat we are doing. Uh, we have upstream Docker and we have a set of patches with the upstream Docker and they, they are all described uh, in our Git repo. So you can read uh, why we have these patches, why Docker didn't accept them and it's all written there. Uh, okay, so here are some links to, to this topic. Mostly they are like what was Docker breaking and how they needed to fix it. Uh, okay, so we are about, we are closing, uh, I mean we are almost at the end. So was the summary of my talk, so yeah, I, I, I guess that I was ranting too much, uh, but that was not my point. My point is that for me Docker is a really great technology, I'm using it daily. For me it solves real problems, but it's really young, still young after three years. They change a lot and you really need to pay attention what's changing and how to use the new stuff. Uh, so let's get back to my, uh, to my first question, which was, is it hard to build a Docker image? So what do you think, is it hard? Because for me it is. <laughs> okay, so this is my last slide. So I'm Tomáš Tomeček, I'm working for Red Hat. I am working on building images. So if you'd like to get in touch with me, just to buy, say hello, and I'd be glad to talk to you. If you'd like to connect with me, I'm using Twitter and Google+, so feel free to add me and, uh, Talk to me, and if you have any questions, I'd be really glad to ask. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, how is it that you, do you have some kind of set of commits to verify the image correctness? Uh, okay, so the question was, how do we test images? So, yeah, I'm working on the, uh, on the engineering part where I develop the way how to build the images. I'm not working on testing them. But yeah, we have an automated test suit which runs on the images and checks if they, are, uh, all this, if they contain like uh, signed RPM packages, if they contain all the labels and that kind of stuff, and this is hooked into a CI, so yeah, we test everything. Uh, uh -huh. uh, well, the thing is that the test suite is pretty, it's really specific for Red Hat, so I don't think it would make sense to open source it. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm not working on the QE, so I, I don't know. So, any more questions? Y yes, please. Uh, I have a question. So, could you point uh, one to some resource or something where there is more kind of real world uh, image building uh, stuff going on? Because usually, uh, even on the Docker uh, documentation, uh, which they have and stuff, usually it's pretty simplistic, right? So, it's usually you want to have different kind of fields, for, as you said, like uh, the field, the, the two-step things that you, you mentioned before, mm -hmm. like the building your field image mm -hmm. and yeah, generating a stream of the star stream and mm -hmm. kind of like reusing that to build one image, for example, for a developer workflow mm -hmm. and the other one, uh, which is almost the same but without the, mm -hmm. you know, like the developer tooling which you usually need, which just needs to be you know, firing on some I notify and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there some, because usually it's just like pretty superficial what, what you find online. Mm -hmm. Is there maybe some Reddit resource? Um, uh, okay, so, so the question was if I can uh, sh show some more resources, how to build images and that kind of stuff. So first thing I would suggest go to the links I, I was showing. Oh, well, for me the best resource for, uh, for learning about Docker is uh, to go through issue tracker and the folks they are writing to issue tracker, they are real people who are using Docker, who are sharing their issues, and more people are sh uh, actually trying to help them. So that's why I educate myself. I also read a lot of blogs, which you can find randomly on the internet. And I was actually getting to it. <laughs> so yeah, and 
in, within Red Hat, we have a lot of resources how we are building images. So if you get in touch with me after the presentation, I can definitely give you more links. Thanks, Denise. <laughs> okay, so any more questions? Yes? So, so you haven't used it? Uh, okay, so the, quest so the question is about Docker Images 3. So the, w the reason I liked it was that uh, if you look at your, um, uh, at all your images, they are basically like uh, Lego or like pancakes, as I was saying. So they are stacked on top of it. So if you look at it, they are, they are making a, like a graph. So you have like a tree. You have one image, which is base of, for all of them. Then you have like base images like Fedora, Rails, CentOS. And then you have your application images, and they create a tree. So the command was actually showing you the whole tree of all your images on your node. So it was like something like PS3 of your processes, but this one's for images. And it was really great to see, like, for example, you have, I don't know, like 10 images coming, uh, getting from Fedora, and you have 20 images from CentOS. And yeah, I, uh, if you, uh, I can show you the tool which does that now, and you can try it on your laptop. Yes? Well, well, uh, well, it's already been in place for a couple of, like, pretty long. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. So we, and it's not like Red Hat specific. You can use it like within your company. It's just a set of, uh, set of labels we want to have on all our images to better identify them. So there's like the description and uh, releasing stuff and where the image is coming from and this kind of stuff. So I, I really like it. I mean, it's great. So if you look. This is not necessarily tied to, you mean it's, it's so high level that it can be applied to Docker or if it's Rocket or any other. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like well, to be honest, uh, Rocket guys were collaborating on them with us. So yeah, it's so generic so everyone can use it. So any more interesting questions? Do we have time? OK, two questions or two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I, I guess not. So uh, I'm glad you attended my talk, and I hope it was you. Ah, uh -huh, yes. Sorry, I'm blind. So yes or no? <laughs> uh, Okay, so thank you for attending my talk. I was, was useful for you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Jo, jo, mám. Okay. Už, už jsem rád, že je to hlavně konečně za mnou, že už se s tím nemusím stresovat. Díky. Okay, so uh, I have a really bad memory, uh -huh, and I'm still speaking to the. Gets 